Daniel. Bennett. Hello. Hello. What are you doing? I'm doing a podcast. What uh, are you doing? I actually just finished grading a bunch of papers, um, and I feel a sense of relief. It's exam time, and when you make your daily dosage of or your daily goal, it just feels... You feel a lot lighter because the insanity of teaching can really weigh in during these moments where you're just in the grind, you know, you're you're grading and grading and grading, and it's very numbing and, and boring and joyless. Nice to have your day uh, wrap up at a nice little 9 p.m., huh? Yeah. No, seriously, that is not, not uh, unusual during exam time. So I'm just, I'm feeling a lot better. I'm also um, relieved to be... To be done with uh, renewing my tag my, for my my license plate. All the adulting crap. Um, what do you call it? Your registration? No, that's different, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, you do have to renew your registration, but you had to get a new tag? Um, well, not a new tag, but the, the, the sticker oh, that goes the on the tag. That is the registration. Yeah, so when people, so wait, when, when you get pulled over by a cop and they say, license and registration, they're not asking for you to go get your tag. What are they saying? That is what they're saying. You 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 hand them the piece of paper on which that sticker originally was. Oh yeah, it comes with a little thing. Yeah. Mm. So it just says that you know the car this car is registered to you and and then some stuff about it. Gotcha. I always lose that thing. I should not get pulled over. I guess. Yeah. Just don't don't get pulled over. I'm sure they can look it up, but you're supposed to have it to show them. Yeah, but anyway, the whole thing was annoying because anytime you deal with the government or the uh, the DMV in particular, it's just extra annoying. And so I would go to the website, and they said, okay, if you want to pay a $2 convenience fee and not come into the DMV, which I think anyone in their right mind would say, fine, this is a little bit of a ripoff, but I'll pay your $2 convenience fee. Um, so mm-hmm. you, you give them... You know, basically all your information, including your social security number, which makes me a little bit uncomfortable. And you click verify, 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 answer some questions. And then you always get the uh, say what letters they are, these are, and they're all funky. Oh, yeah. Um, the CAPTCHA. Yeah, the CAPTCHA. And it's and there was even an op- like an option to have the ro- robot say it out loud, and you can listen to it, say it really robotically. And, right, in but, case you're blind, in case you're a blind yeah. person using yep, the using site. this complicated visual interface, um, exactly. So I would put all the information in. Um, the interface actually wasn't that complicated; it was straightforward. In, in case you're a blind person on your computer trying to renew your driver's <laughs> registration <laughs> for your car, <laughs> yeah, so accessible, so accessible. So what an oppressive society we live in, but. Um, I put in all the information, and then the last stage would say, we found your records, click to continue. And I would click it, and it would loop me back to the beginning, asking for my name. And at first I thought, okay, I mean, this happens, the internet does weird things, connections get lost, whatever. But it would continually loop me through. And then... Were you on uh, dmv.com or dmv.ru? It was Renew Now or some new Florida website thing um, that makes uh, so it fast it and a, easy with a new interface responding to. It wasn't public. a Russian. It wasn't a Russian website or anything. Are you? Is that how many? Yeah. How many porn ads were on the side of the site? Oh, I mean seven, eight. No, I don't know. I didn't. I think it was like one of these scrolling. Um, I just kept oh, clicking yeah. and getting lost in it. So I don't know. I didn't count the number of clicks I made, but. Um, Mm-hmm. No, so what it would do, it eventually said on my third loop around, it's like someone's trying to log into your account. Uh, we will give you a one-time password uh, to get try one more time, essentially. And I went to my email and did it again, and, and it just logged me out. And it's like, I, I hate this so much. I just, I just want to not give you my money, but begrudgingly give you my money so you can give me a sticker that says, I have this... I've paid for this sticker. Like, I'm not really sure what I'm paying for. Like, we accept it's this a tax. term. It's a tax. That's all it is. Registration. It's that, that it's registered. Yes, it's a tax. It's explicitly a tax. Okay. So, and so we have to walk around with the mark of the beast that says you've paid this tax and here it is on your car. And so that they can yes. see if you have it. Is there any other tax I mean, it's the like same, that? Uh, uh, postage stamps. Um, any other kind of registration that you have to do. 
Yeah, well, I, post, I, I mean, a postage stamp is pointless, right? You buy a sticky little piece of paper to stick it on some other paper. And but that's then it all. does something. Like it gets the. the I can understand. No, it doesn't do anything. Will they deliver? It's a sticky they, piece. Yeah, it doesn't. You don't need the stamp to deliver an envelope. Well, an envelope clearly, holds the letter just the same way. It's a. Well, it's a tax. I get that. That's like a ticket. Like a like a. If you were at an amusement park and you needed a ticket to get on the ride, obviously the ride would run anyway. Um, but you need that ticket, and you're buying, you get a service. You get to ride this ride, or you get your letter delivered. But I already have a car that runs and the roads that I pay taxes for those roads. So what am I – is this a ticket, like a, an admission to the roads? It's not really because that's paying taxes, right, or that's getting the car. I don't – it's just an additional crappy adult thing it's that's a, hard to justify. It's an additional tax. Yeah, yeah. it's a tax on – uh, on owning a usable automobile. Well, I'll tell you, I was getting frustrated, and it was saying what I ended up doing is there was a it locked me out. It just didn't work. And then mm-hmm. there was this try the app for four dollars. I'm like, this feels just sketchy. Like two dollars for the convenience fee online, but four dollars for the app convenience fee. Even easier. Mm-hmm. So I right. download it. Uh, I speak with a robot, and it finds everything just fine. Um, and then it asked for my tag, which I actually embarrassingly did not know. And then I realized there's a lot of things we have memorized. Like I have my address memorized. I have a, my phone number, my social security. And then there's like a second tier of things, which I need frequently, but I don't have memorized like my bank account number, uh, my driver's license number and my tag kind of fits into that do you agree that there's this sort of two tier maybe even three tiers of information we should have readily available and to the extent you've recorded a memory is you know varying um yeah i mean kind of uh i mean yeah it's definitely second tier when compared to like your birth date and you know your uh your phone number and stuff but Mm -hmm. i mean i would say maybe the tag is of the ones you listed the most important uh, just because, like, if you're ever getting a parking permit or um, if your car <clears throat> anything stolen. like that, yeah, or you get your car stolen, <laughs> then, you know, you, you need to know your tag. But honestly, how many times do you need to know your tag number per year? Like, maybe Three. two. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. Yeah. I mean, something like, like that. it's going back when you pay for parking downtown or something and you go, ah, yeah. crap, I got to go run back and so not, see what it is. Not that much. And like, um, as far as like your bank account numbers, like, uh, eh, I mean, those are long numbers and you don't really need to have them memorized. I, I mean, sometimes it's nice to be able to recognize them for selecting accounts and stuff. I th- maybe the last four digits of your different various cards, it's nice to mm-hmm. at least be able to recognize. But, eh, I mean, you, most of that stuff is pretty readily to hand anyway. You can just look at it and, and see. Well, right, I guess the whole the, this whole boring story is because it's just they made it boring, they made it difficult, and they, I was this close to giving up. It was claiming because my birthday has passed, even though I've paid for – it's paid through December, and it was saying I'm going to have to pay a late fee. And then I was about to give up, and that would have been to their benefit if they ended up taxing me or, or giving me a ticket for not being registered, to which I would, you know – go pay for registration and a ticket. So good for them for making it difficult. Like it's not in their best interest to make it easy for us. So screw you government. That's That's frustrating. Yeah. I hate it too. I I absolutely hate it. Um, And uh, I I hate how it's based. The the amount you pay is based on the value of your car um, and varies state to state. Like it's just a, it's just so much BS. I I really hate it. When I was younger, though, I I was totally, I mean, I had this idea of, like, what I do is my business and the government should stay completely out. And, and now that I've gotten older, I think I've come to a more mature understanding of what it means to be part of a society. And, like, I'm all for, like, you got to tax me for the roads. I do use them. I'm fine with that. I don't know what number is reasonable. We could debate that. But I would agree that I should contribute to that because I use it and I want it and I want them to be in good shape. Um, but it just gets silly when, when you start introducing all these different tolls and different, like, just give me, like, like, can we just decide what's fair? Can you show me how we arrived at these numbers? Can we debate it out? And then can that be that? Like, can I just buy my car and be done with it? 
uh, and that's you know like keep it simple. All this stuff right. is well, silly. <clears throat> yeah, if only. Uh, the problem is that the the government budget is so gigantic that. You know, when when it comes crunch time and they want a, a new program or they, they want to increase the funding, then they have to desperately search for means to tax people and get more money. And so you have all of these different ideas for methods of taxation, and that's where all this stuff comes from. And so, you know, there are some kinds of taxes that are somewhat reasonable. At least the area that you're taxed matches the product or service that is being used. So, for example, with car registration, paying for roads, if we assume that the money that you're using to pay for your registration goes to road upkeep, which is not the case, yeah. um, then it would make sense, right? Because the roads get deteriorated by the cars that drive on them. Right, including the only that. cars that drive on roads... Uh, so basically a registration is a method of taxing the cars that are driven on roads. If your car is just sitting in your yard, it doesn't have to be registered. But if you are actually on the road driving, it has to be registered. Yeah. So that's, that, that is, you know, like if we were starting a government from scratch and I wanted to, uh, I had to make people pay for roads, that is a reasonable uh, way to tax only the people using the roads, right? Is to tax yeah, registration cars being used, and so registering the, the, the cars. Um, toll roads are actually another way to do that uh, reasonably, because then the people who are actually on the roads are having to pay money for the roads, even though I and hate they're paying toll it roads. when they're using it too. So it's almost a direct right. cost, which uh, yeah, get a sand right. pass so, or something I like mean, that and use it. In terms of reasonableness, like just considered from that standpoint, it's it's fine. The problem comes in when you realize that we are taxed when we're paid an exorbitant amount comes straight out of our paycheck when we're paid, and then we're taxed for everything we buy, everything, uh, right. and then we have to pay for registration and a driver's license, and then we pay a tax on gasoline. Of course, that fits in with sales tax, but there's additional taxes on gas. And then a lot of stuff being talked about now, particularly with all of the climate change stuff, a lot of people want to push carbon emission taxes. Uh, That's what all this rioting is about over in France right now is because they have really, really high carbon emission taxes. Over 60% of what they pay for in fuel is tax. And like, I mean, just think about how much of every dollar that you make goes to the government. Like it's just it's ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, and there is no breakdown of how your tax dollar gets spent. Right. You don't get to see where your money goes; it just goes into a giant pool, a pool that is already in a huge amount of debt, and then uh, and then people just frivolously spend it. So, right, yeah, it just ends up in a bucket basically, and then they they do the budgeting when it just and it never it, it should never have never been goes that. backwards never goes backwards once a department has a budget then uh, it's really really hard to shrink that budget without people just pitching a fit the right. next year well so it's just a just a huge mess uh so i definitely sympathize with your dmv experience um i i, I don't think that I can't remember if I've renewed my. I think I do. I have renewed my registration online every time. I did it for two um, years this time. It was. It didn't save you any money, but it was. It was literally double the cost. You could do it right there. But I was like, you know what? I don't want to go through this every year. So I did it. Right. Um. Yeah, that's just a big pain. Ah. Uh. Well, I have um a a new thing. I think I may have mentioned it on a previous podcast. But a new thing that I want to test you on. Mm, I like tests. So this is called Daniel Does Science. Do, 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 do. Science. Right, exactly. I was thinking we need a jingle right there. <laughs> so I know that you're a, uh, you're a science expert. Science wizard, teach, I prefer the term. You teach science, right? Yeah, actually it's English. Um, oh. But well. it might have, English is in the humanities and humans use science. So I know what there I'm talking go. about. There we go, master of words. <laughs> well, no, but seriously, this idea sounds funny. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna, you should explain it more, but but uh, <laughs> go ahead and explain it more <laughs> before I go comment. ahead and explain what more. Daniel does science. What's this idea? Oh, Daniel does science. 
Uh, it's just well, since you're a science expert, I want to, I want you to teach me and all of our listeners about science. Mm, okay. Uh, so I'll just prompt you with some really easy science question that you can then explain to us. Um, so, for example. <laughs> I'm feeling nervous. I'm actually feeling nervous because the the humor of this segment is that I'm admittedly I have like large knowledge gaps with regard to science specifically, which science is such a general category. It's embarrassing to say, but like I'm a reasonably intelligent human being. Um, I just don't know a lot, and this this is uh, this sounds like it's designed to uh, to really capture or, or expose those knowledge gaps. So I'm going to give it my best. Let's. Uh, I'm going to teach you some science here. I'm ready. I've no one my... could possibly. F- no one could possibly find your knowledge gaps in science funny. No, you're right. Um, I'm ready to teach the class. So let's let's pick our subject. You you hit me with it, and I will educate the hell out of you. So what? Uh, can you just tell me? Like, there's a lot of terms for these little things so like mitochondria yeah mitochondria is a good one yeah um so atom and ion and molecule and cell what are those things um they're the they're the basic building parts of life (laughs) um that's right i mean that's right so as you know there's like small things and then there's smaller things and then there's smaller and smaller things in this world like things that are be that are not visible to the the naked eye the human eye and so uh when the microscope was invented it opened up a whole new world we realized um wow is that when they saw the first atom no it's when they discovered germs and they thought wow there's this whole world that exists and and, and people you've seen like it's almost a trope in cartoons that you know you zoom into the grass and you have the whole insect world or you zoom into the hair and there's like uh flakes and lice yeah lice and they have their whole little like colonies (laughs) and stuff so they realized well what about those colonies? colonies are there colonies zoomed in on top of their heads um, right. And that's where and you. Those are the atoms. Yeah, atoms are the. Uh, <laughs> all right, so I think atoms. Atoms are the, are the smallest, smallest colony yes. on lice. Atoms. Uh, <laughs> atoms are the smallest colony on lice. They are the no. They're the smallest building blocks of, of of I guess, living and non living things. Everything's made of of atoms. Like that is the. You can't. You can't. Well, I hear. I hear the term splitting an atom. I've. I, you know, I'm familiar that that can is uh, is dangerous because that seems. <laughs> if you've split the most, like, how can you split what is the smallest? Like what? What happens if it's literally the most divided thing you can possibly that exists? What does it mean to split one? I honestly, mm-hmm. I, I I don't know. Um, don't know about that one. Yeah, well, it, I all guess right. It really well, can't. actually, that's uh, you know, that's not bad. Okay, that's not bad. All right, so that's a fair enough definition of atom. So good job. Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, what about an ion? What what the heck is an ion? Well, ions. Um. <laughs> so let me think about. This is where it gets confusing. This isn't electrons and protons and neutrons. Are these ions? No, but no. No. Okay, so what are they circling around? What are ions circling around? Wait, what? Neutrons, protons. God, this has been a minute, man. Ions. Yeah. Um, I don't even know where to begin because I, I, ions. I don't. So what's I a all right, even, what's a proton? Well, this is the protons have a plus, a positive charge. Yeah, that's right. Electrons have it, a though? negative charge. Yeah, that's right. And neutrons and are, are what do neutral, they have? <laughs> right? Right, and yeah, I right. want to say they like. I don't know what the hell they are. They they like. I picture them like having these. Pathways. So is a proton. Which one do you think is bigger, a proton or an atom? Well, I thought atom was the the smallest building box block. So a proton would be much bigger. 
Hmm. Would a proton be built, how many, built of atoms? How many atoms do you think could would be inside of a proton? Like, uh, I really want to say like hundreds, you know? Hundreds? Uh, hundreds. Few hundred. Few hundred. How many atoms do you think? How many atoms do you think are inside of an electron? Then, if an electron is a negative charge, see, I don't know why I'm picturing these charts where there's like electrons and uh, neutrons circling around a proton or something. They're floating around, mm-hmm. kind of like mm-hmm. what is what is the thing? I don't even know what to give you, Bennett. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not working with enough. I'm not working with enough knowledge. To, to... I love it. So what? Uh, what? What is a molecule? Um, this, does this have to do with water? No, um, water molecules. Okay, so a molecule is when elements, I don't know what an element is. Other What's than an chart. element? It's on the chart. You know, you've seen the chart where you memorize. And the periodic, periodic, periodic table, table of, of elements. elements. Of elements, yeah. And so you have So that. what's an element? So, it, you know, well, there's a lot of them. And they're just, they're usually one or two letters that's short for something. And you have to memorize their, they have a bunch of numbers. Um, mm-hmm. And there's a, the noble what, what gas, are the numbers? The noble gases, you know, they kind of do that staircase on, on the right side. Um, and yeah, then, man. Uh, so these, so by the way, an element, wait, where was, so when elements are connected to each other, like H2O, then you have uh-huh. an H2O molecule. So that's two hydrogen yeah. and an oxygen and that's water. Na- so then you get us. Nailed guess, it. Yeah. So. I don't know what to say about an element, though, because an element has these, like, neutron numbers or has some sort of numbers that you they, – mm-hmm. they all have numbers. I remember you had to memorize they do. them in science. They do have numbers. Yeah. yeah. What the – huh, well, you got a lot of pieces here. Yeah, I've got a lot of pieces I'm working with that I don't I – don't... What about – all right, so what about a cell? What's a cell? That's where you get you, the mitochondria and those sorts of things come in. So <laughs> cell is the yeah. basis of like a living organism, I guess. So we're made of cells and you can see those under a microscope. So I guess that's like one of the, you can see your... Um, can you see an atom under a microscope? Um, mm, no. Is it just in theory that we understand them maybe? I don't know. I don't feel like you can see atoms. You just we just know them based on like principles, and mm. that's my my that's what, how I figure it. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, you're definitely not a, like a microscope. It's going to be in your high school science lab. I mean, maybe in some super science lab you can see some atoms. I don't know. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> so cells. How big are so cells? You can see under a microscope. And you can't see atoms under a microscope, but maybe a proton. Um. Okay, so I still don't know what ions and proton, the relationship between ions, protons. What the heck's a proton? In like, does it have the electrons swiveling around it? Or let me ask. Uh, let me ask this. What? So you know, elements are the things in the periodic table yes. of elements. Can you can, how many elements? Can, can you name ten elements? Um, I'm sure. I mean, you're challenging me to do that. So, um, there's like gold, uranium, hydrogen, uh-huh. oxygen, nitrogen. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. um, it's like naming sports teams for for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, like, I, I would know. The parallel I, you could sh- is so similar. You I could really show, like it. You could show me. Isn't it, like, weird? Like, AU is gold or something. And That's like, right. Yeah. And AU so, is gold. Like, if I were to have it sitting in front of me, I'd look and go, oh, radon and... Oh, radon. That's another one. Yeah. And, like, there's an X one, but I don't know how... Uh, there's you a whole... six so far. Um, you only got four more. <laughs> well, let me try and do this. Um, radon. Is there rate Radon... Uh, I'm sure there's just some really obvious ones that I'm, I'm missing here. Um, did I do hydrogen and oxygen? Did I do oxygen? Uh, you did hydrogen. Yeah, I, I don't think I did oxygen. Did you do? I don't think you did oxygen. So yeah, seven. Um. Mm. Oh, I don't know. Not right now. I don't know. 
No. 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 Seven. So seven. I got a seven. But you got seven seven elements. That's not I know so bad. Seventy percent of science. <laughs> well, not well. All right. So do you want me to? <laughs> yeah. Can we fill in what? some of the... why, why don't we just leave it at that? Yeah, we can do that, but I do want to circle around when we're not in the podcast and like go, I I feel like I should just know (laughs) this as a human being, you know. Uh, Well, hey, that's pretty good. Um, You know, you... You didn't. You didn't do that bad with that one, honestly. Like really, yeah. You know, building building blocks of life and and well, cell quickly and tell me about ions. Then I, that one's that one's bugging me more than the others. Uh, an ion is uh, is just it's a charged particle. Um, so an an atom uh, or a, a molecule that has uh, it's basically missing. A uh, or has an extra electron or or something on it, so it has a, a charge. Okay, it's missing an electron or has an extra one. How did I? So the ion was is it ionic number? Is that it actually that you have to memorize? What are the things you have to memorize? Uh, the the atomic number. Atomic the number. atomic number. And then you do some it. math the, to calculate, or you minus one minus the other, right. and you get something. Right. So yeah, so. Yeah, so the uh, the atomic weight tells you how many protons and uh, yeah, this is boring. Well, I don't, you can, I don't you can figure out how yeah, many. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> so so an, an an atom an atom is constructed of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Yes. Oh, okay, that's an atom that they're circling around. Why do I think of the circling so, around? So the nucleus of an atom is protons and neutrons, kind of smushed together, and the electrons orbit around That's the, the, electrons the nucleus. Orbit. That's what you're thinking of. So you you kind of had it. You know, you were in the ballpark there. Now, of course, a proton is, is small is the, a building block of an atom. So you were wrong on hundreds of atoms and a proton. Um, but uh, so mm. like an, a hydrogen atom is is just a proton. Okay. So the nu- the nucleus of a single proton. hydrogen atom is only a proton, and then helium goes up, and it's a a, a proton and a neutron. So a proton uh, is the smallest they, thing. I don't. No, well, there there, as we get better and better, and and more and more into theoretical crap, they can theorize smaller and smaller. So actually, quarks are the building blocks of subatomic particles like protons and stuff but but i didn't i didn't go that far uh so i don't i'm not an expert on quarks and quantum crap how did uh, i meet your expectations uh pretty much exactly um <laughs> that i'm working with the pieces that don't really make sense <laughs> yes yes yeah. yeah it's weird to actually have to articulate something you don't understand and try to you're bumping up against knowledge gaps. You don't have the language, but you have these vague, like I think I colored some sheets and, you know, ninth grade yeah, science. Some red balls like, and yeah. blue balls and yellow balls and stuff. <laughs> and I thought, um, even in ninth grade, I was like, this is crap. Like, this is not a good way to teach me. Just giving me a coloring sheet and I don't want to learn But you nailed the molecule one, though. You nailed that with H2O. So good, well, good job on I that. Well, I took chemistry and remember having to work with that a lot. Like that, that I don't remember much more than that but that's like remembering then water embarrassada means pregnant in spanish it's like you didn't uh, my favorite mean... spanish word <laughs> but, i love that right but it's not like you learned spanish but you remember this ob- this thing that stood out to you well i mean if i if i'm working with elements every day and having to i don't even remember what we did with them but we did some complicated things with them and uh <laughs> then i'm gonna remember at least what an element it you know is so Sure. <sighs> that was uh. That's yep. that makes me sweat. How many, uh, like that's embarrassing. Really? It's, well, it's not yeah. easy to. No, I, it's forgivable did, to uh, not you... know sports. It's not really as forgivable to expose like just what could quickly be associated with intelligence. You know. Um, uh, I don't know. That's arguable. I don't really think that uh, science trivia is that associated with intelligence. But it's well, and, you're and right. Same, but it's like, not trivia. It's just trivia. It is trivia. Well, I guess it is, but I it's mean, building blocks don't... to do real scientific things. But whereas, like, like knowing when, when baseball was... teams, you're not going to do any. That's never. You can never do anything with it other than gain well, social you capital. Do... You know. Well, you can't do anything with an atom or or an ion. You do like, everything. I mean... We are all atoms. Like, <laughs> it's... no, yeah, but in your day to day, like, you don't need the knowledge of what an atom is or what a proton is. 
to, to do anything. In right. Fact. But it's I could... only the people who specialize in chemistry that benefit from that knowledge, really. I mean, we all benefit indirectly from other people who have that knowledge. Right. But, like, we don't, you don't really need to know what an atom is. Just like I don't need to know who Sammy Sosa is. Well, we don't need to know it, but it's or actionable. Or Soldier Boy. If it's. <laughs> Soldier boy, that's where you went. <laughs> so I don't need to know who those people are. I understand, even though I do, because I'm a big fan of them. It's similar in that that neither thing you need to know. Sammy Soldier. What's <laughs> it's it's similar in that regard. I agree with you, but it's different that once you have that knowledge, it is actionable if you choose for it to be. Whereas. Like, what can you do with pop culture knowledge or sports knowledge other than say to other people, hey, insert pop culture knowledge here. Oh, we're kind of alike. So you, I mean, maybe connectivity, you could make the argument that connecting and social capital is way more valuable than, you know, some scientific knowledge that could serve you in a laboratory if you were to dedicate your all your days to it. Uh, well, look at it this way. So... You know, atoms and molecules. Chemistry is is an important field of science. That's your, your that's what you're arguing for. That it's really important, and you can do something with it. But so is I mean, there are so many areas of science. So what about um, astronomy? You know, like mm-hmm. knowledge of other galaxies. Like you can do stuff with that, right. and no, you, know, you right. can make a career out of that. But and, and same thing about uh, fossils, right? You can there are tons of different fossils, and you can try to date the fossils and categorize the species and all kinds of stuff like that. But how useful is that stuff if you're outside of the field? Well, so then why did it get chosen to be? T- I guess it's embarrassing because I've been taught it before, or I've yeah they've taught it to yeah, me before. Okay. That so. makes sense. I mean that that I can understand because then the embarrassing thing is forgetting knowledge, but yeah. that's not that embarrassing. Everyone forgets the knowledge, so. Um, but like, I mean, when it comes to, uh, these are really just facts that are out there. So, you know, my knowledge of sports teams or your knowledge of subatomic particles, pretty, I would, I would really put those in the same ballpark. Uh, (laughs) I want to know what 20 somethings and 30 somethings out there, if they were listening to this, that also have no interest in science, particularly, I mean, like me, basically, how knowledgeable they are if if they're sitting there going like scrambling like I am or if they're like oh come on Daniel you you should know this and I'd really like I to I think know. they're I think they're probably closer to you um this is only based on my experience going to a f- handful of trivia uh things uh and like the 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 trivia uh thing I went to the guy Mostly asked sports questions, which was really annoying to mm-hmm. me. I was a very ineffectual trivia team member um, <laughs> there. But occasionally, occasionally, he would do a bonus question in the science category. And because I think his understanding of science was, you know, uh, your level or worse, he would pick ultra easy questions because I think they were just gibberish to him. And he would ask them <laughs> expecting no one to get it right. I thought the questions were hilariously easy, but then I would find that, you know, my team, because of me, was the only one answering those questions. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and so, like, I think if I if that's my only sample size, then, uh, that, then I would think that probably a lot of people are in the same boat. Well, like, as, and pulling a you. trivia guy, if he does this in other venues and like travels around because that's very frequent like one trivia guy will do several restaurants and make a little small business out of it like he knows what's a difficult science question he knows to ask the easier questions because he's he's actually by polling him you're polling a, a lot of people that go to a you know a burger place and and do that sort of thing so um mm-hmm. you are getting a lot of people uh, one 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 last quick question, uh, because I actually put I did a little bit of work, uh, a very tiny amount of work for this. I meant to ask, how many, how many atoms do you think could fit in a cell? Oh man, um, I mean, I would think it could be thousands. Maybe like t- uh, ten thousand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me. Let you, mm, no, I'm gonna say like a hundred thousands. 
atoms. Hundred thousand. Yeah, I, I, I just have this idea of like a cell. Well, a whole cell. I guess it has mitochondria. Oh, well. Yeah, it has a mitochondria. How many atoms in a mitochondria? Oh, well, then I, I'm just going to say like a million and then see what the a real million. number is. That's my, if I'm actually going to put on like the prices <laughs> right and like I have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and if you were to say a million and I had to bet a dollar or a million and one, I would just go, I'd actually go a million and one because I feel like the answer you're going to shout out is like a hundred million or something. But I'm just going to go with a million. So tell me, <laughs> what's the answer? <laughs> Um, the, the answer is 8.54 times 10 to the 13th. That is about, that is 10, almost 10 million millions. Oh man. So, uh, I would have bet a million so and a one, lot. by the way. I think I said that for real. So, yeah. So you, you would have been right if everyone else guessed, you know, a hundred. If I were the last one betting, I really would have just gone one over whatever. Cause I just don't know, but that's okay. Now. Wow. Of course, like the little asterisk after that is that that's based on a lot of assumptions. Like I assumed oxygen and the radius, the the measured sort of radius of oxygen, and I assumed an average skin cell. So cells can be fairly big or fairly small, and so whatever. But anyway, like that's the number I calculated out. So why uh... it's a big number. <laughs> It seems like it would be a, almost a semi-common Google question. How many atoms in a cell? Like, would that not give you a little answer? Um, I did Google it. Uh, I did Google that, and after I calculated the number and verified, at least on some little blurb thing, that some researchers at Washington University estimated that it was about 10 to the 14th. So I, I don't know what atom and cell they used but it's pretty close to mine uh, my estimate so nice. uh that was pretty nice well i'm impressed color color mm. me impressed color me impressed <laughs> so all right well good job at science thanks i'm uh i'm learning and getting better every day can't wait to quiz you on more science in the future um, i'm looking forward to it i'll study up so i'll impress <laughs> you like i really i want you to ask something that i absolutely nail like gosh i would love that <laughs> Yeah, I would be. I, that would uh, that would please me. It would please me to ask you something about pop culture, and you know well, it. <laughs> well, see, I think that you know, I asked you that that stuff about atoms and all. That's really is just trivia. But I asked if I asked you something more technology related or biology related that you could reason through and you could think, oh, here's my experience with this. So now that I think about it, this is how it must work. I, you could probably figure out some stuff. Well, right. Like that wasn't a particularly inventive line of questioning or why no, is why is this the way it is? I can start inventing, right. uh, but saying like, what are protons? And you're like, well, crap. Uh, what are they? I forgot. And there's not much to invent <laughs> there. I mean, I can't say, right. well, you see two electrons fell in love. You know, there's not like, and in, in, with any credibility, so um, gave birth to a proton. Anyway, um, yeah. So thank you for that. No, nope, no problem. <laughs> You're welcome. Anytime. Uh, so um, I've actually I've got another uh, another topic that I think would be interesting conversation. Okay. Um, and it's something that we've talked about before. Uh, a little bit, especially, I don't know, I find it particularly interesting. I think you and I both have an interest in psychology. Definitely. Um, and so I know you've heard of the Myers-Briggs typology right. indicator. And my understanding is that's one of the the king of personality tests or along those lines. It's very respected. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's widely known, it's popular, and there's a big business around it, so... Um, in that respect, uh, yes. When you say big uh, business, are you saying that companies will invest in it, get their employees to take the test so that they can work better and blah, blah, blah? Yes. Okay. Yes. And a lot of uh, – uh, uh, well, that's one of the criticisms of it is that people with a vested interest in the typology make money and they fund research. And so it's – primarily researched and it's kind of a cycle of money uh, there's some i don't know how much legit legitimacy there is to the criticism but some people criticize it because they feel like it's not quite as wholesome you know like there's money getting fed into it to support the business it's a money-making thing right 
Um, well, I mean, and it's not, but, it's right to be skeptical of any sort of personality test because we're so. I mean, there's so we're so what multivariable, or there's so many aspects to us. I mean, it's hard to when you want to categorize, you're going to simplify, and that's what it does. Is it well, simplifies that's true. and that's categorizes. True. Um, that's inevitable, right? No, I definitely agree with that. In fact, well, but I will say this: like when I was when I was a, a little younger, before I read about the Myers Briggs test personality indicator. Um, I thought that same thing. I was like, I am too unique and special, and like people, there's people that are way, way, way different from me, and there's so many different kinds of people that there's no way, impossible, for this thing to categorize them, even anything approaching accurately. Right. But, but like after reading about it more, and after taking the personality test, and having other people I knew take the personality test. And then over years, talking to people, asking what their type was, I began, it kind of convinced me, like, I mean, I think there's something to it is like, can it perfectly capture the intricacies of everyone's personality? No, I mean, certainly not. But in terms of connecting some, some dots and common behaviors and differing behaviors between people, I, I think there's something there, which is really kind of impressive. Um, considering some of the history uh, of the uh, of the test, it is especially um, you said the differing personalities because if it's it's not like reading a horoscope where it says something very agreeable and vague and generic. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, the, these once you've oh, taken yeah. the test, it says specifics about your personality. I mean, sure, it paints it kind of in a favorable light or whatever, or how to use it for good or all of, all of that stuff. But but it is sure. specific. It is targeted. It's not just you're the kind of person who enjoys people. Well, or I mean, well, I guess it kind of. Gets well, I mean, it may say something like that, but the the real the real thing is that it it could tell you you're the kind of person that enjoys people, or it could tell you you're the kind of person that doesn't enjoy people. Like it takes a stand, whereas a horoscope you know it doesn't really take a stand mm -hmm. uh it tells you something that could be applied to you know almost anyone whereas this will tell you something that can't necessarily be applied to anyone um so um uh, because there are dichotomies in it right? isn't it just so, four dichotomies fact, yeah there's just four four dichotomies so i guess i'll just mention them so there's uh introversion and extroversion right and that's pretty familiar uh, to everybody Right. So, I mean, introversion and extroversion, they, they call them the, you know, whether you're inward turning or outward turning. So, like, uh, extroverts have a preference for uh, people and behaviors and things and actions. You know, they like, like to, to, to go out and, and do, whereas introverts kind of have a preference towards the world of ideas and reflection and crap like that. The way that I, the way that I usually think about introvert extrovert distinction is that uh introverts are drained by interacting with other people and extroverts are energized by interacting with other people right how you get that your seems charge to be, right you get your charge by being alone right. you get your charge by being with people that seems that that seems to hold true anyway at least in the people that i've asked who are extroverts and introverts and um that seems to to hold true and then i i read an interesting thing too and this, see what you think about this, um, that introverts kind of their, their series of action in the world is to first reflect and then act and then reflect. So think and, and reflect and then act based on that and then reflect on your prior action. Whereas for extroverts, it's act and then reflect and then act. So I don't know. It's just kind of an, that, it it suggests that extroverts are more impulsive, right? I mean, that's what it comes down to when I hear reflect and then act or think before you act, you know, you're control. But if you act before you think, you're being impulsive. Um, I don't like that. The re or I'm not going to say I don't like it, but the reason I'm resisting that a bit is because it seems to me that um, – if it's about getting your charge from people and enjoying being out and being social – I mean, inherently that you're going to take more risks when you're being social, you're, you're putting yourself out there more. So I guess in some ways it does make sense that you're acting 
and then collecting data and reflecting on how that went. Whereas the person who's drained by these social acts, uh, you know, they don't want, they, they don't, that, that, that's a risk. So instead of that risk might outweigh the, the benefits. So they reflect or they think about it first. And if you have a tendency to be thinking about, is this worth it or not? Of course, it's going to drain you. So that's why it, it's more draining is because you're thinking about it beforehand. Uh, so, I mean, it makes sense, but I'm just, I think we fall into that trap of thinking extroverts like people and introverts don't. Extroverts are outgoing and do more and are impulsive and introverts are reserved and quiet and shy. Like, I, like we, we, we attach a lot to those two terms that I think is unfair. And what you just said makes me worry that it is attaching more, all that unfairness. I had a, I had kind of a similar reaction to that categorization of introvert extrovert. Um, I, I wasn't sure if I was okay with that or not. Well, just because the primary way I had thought of it before was the whole you know drained by interaction or fueled by interaction. Mm-hmm. That one definitely that one I think is the strongest uh, characterization of introvert extrovert to me. Um, but I think if I look at it through a certain lens, the act reflect act thing kind of kind of makes sense if I categorize it in terms of energy expenditure, so like for an introvert, um, acting, assuming that acting is social acting is an energy expenditure and you don't want to needlessly expend energy and waste that energy. So you start off and, and you reflect or rather think about how you're going to spend the energy and Mm -hmm. then you act and then you reflect and think, did I spend that energy well? Or whatever other introverted th- thinking you do. Whereas as an extrovert, it's not uh, like expending that energy. Well, I mean, it it's gives you energy to act, right? right? To interact with people gives you energy. So there's no real need to think about the expenditure of energy in that way because, well, you're just going to do it. And then you'll think about it right. and reflect later, and, and that's where you spend the energy, and then act again. L- let me. So from that, in that view, it kind of makes sense, but yeah, primarily I think the the energy expenditure thing makes the most sense. The thing is, let me throw this out. Um, uh-huh. Being all right, there's we we kind of delineate between thinking and then acting, and those are two separate things. Or and, and oftentimes in a party situation or whatever, acting is just merely like talking, right? Sharing your thoughts aloud, that sort of thing. Uh, that's what being social means very often. So what if you actually combine the two and thought of like an extrovert tends to think, but they just it's not like one thinks more than the other. That's a whole different category. Um, they're both thinking, but maybe the extrovert thinks aloud and with people, and that's why, like, like you were saying, to give energy. There's not you're you're not giving energy to get energy. You're just you're thinking and you're talking are kind of simultaneous and out loud. Whereas the introvert tends to maybe think beforehand. So then 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 that action can be more draining. Does that make any sense? Oh uh, yeah, that that makes sense. Your relationship sense. Uh, to thinking I mean, and, and thinking and talking and how much that's happening at the same time. I mean, <laughs> uh yeah, right. I mean, I think that um well, uh, uh, on a to to take a separate uh, to consider this thought separately from personality anyway. Like I think that talking is thinking. In a way, mm-hmm. right? I mean, a lot of the things that we say, especially in in conversation, is us. I mean, we these are things we're thinking for the first time. Definitely, I mean, sometimes yeah. I think about things beforehand and then I say them. But I would say the most enjoyable and probably beneficial aspects of conversation are the times when I'm thinking as I'm speaking. Right, you stumble upon a new thought and you're sorting through it out loud with a friend to bounce it off of and sharpen it. The idea. Right. Well, and sometimes when it's in your head, it's vague and ill-formed, and and you don't feel out the boundaries and the edges of a thought. You just have this wisp of of idea or something, and you go, oh, yeah, and it, but you're doing something else, or another thought comes in and takes its place. But when you're speaking, you have to take that thought and and give it form. You have to put it into words and 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 and. Uh, make it latch on to meaning and then convey it in a way that it can be understood. So 
understood and, and way, challenged, kind of, so I can say, wait, that doesn't well, make yeah, sense definitely. or whatever. Right, right. And and so once I put it out there, then you know, there's a good chance that you're going to 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 mold it and twist it and put it back and then we're gonna bounce that idea back and forth Mm -hmm. so i that's kind of a divergence from personality stuff but um like with respect to extroverts thinking while they're speaking that's just what it made me think of um and you know i think there there may be something something to that well right my thoughts Uh, have baked because of course an introvert's also thinking while they're speaking but but maybe they've already formulated their thought. They've molded. They've done more molding internally than the, possibly than the extrovert. Or the extrovert's more comfortable molding it together, uh, or out loud with other people. I, I don't know. Well, I just well, if we only take these two pieces of information, it makes me think that extroverts have an advantage because if speaking is thinking or or may perhaps even the best way of thinking is when you're speaking now uh, that's a arguable term i think that's arguable, arguable statement yeah. but if uh if that's the case and extroverts gain energy by interacting interacting is often speaking then they're encouraged to think well perhaps. so it could be the case that extroverts think more what about that oh. for a statement <laughs> And extroverts think more, or at least have their ideas sharpened by others more, and that's almost certainly the case if they're out interacting more, and that's and because they come from that point of view, that's why, I mean, it's an often held belief on extroverts. They're like, oh, poor introverts if they just, you know, they're just shy or they don't understand these benefits, and then introverts get kind of annoyed. At least it seems. I mean, these are I'm stereotyping the two types, but you know, the introverts are like, ah, you're just. You, you know, you, you you misunderstand me, you mislabel me. Um, these two mm. perspectives are really interesting. But you say it's better, but an extrovert's risking a lot in terms of they could offend someone or just misrepresent their ideas, or especially in our hyper, you know, politically correct culture, you end up saying some, you know, an, a half baked idea that just comes across as whatever ist, you know, racist, homophob, homophobist, um, you know, all the ists yeah. out there. Uh, or you're just sorting through an idea and you 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 mess up and offend someone and like that's risky. I shouldn't just I shouldn't have just dumped the political correctness thing in. But I mean, you know, any area you come across, right. you reveal your ignorances as you think aloud. So I that's hate risky. the homeless. Oh, you're such a hobo. You're such a hobophobe. <laughs> A, a hobophobe, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. even that term like is <laughs> would offend the hell out of someone, right? Hobophobic. Um, <laughs> do you know? Uh, <laughs> oh, hobophobic. Do you know? It actually kind of is a, a pleasurable word to say. Hobophobic. It's like fun to say. Yeah, it is kind it's of bouncy. And, yeah. But like, I actually don't know. Or uh, do you know the term that you use for homeless people that is politically correct? Um. Uh, uh, mm, dregs of society. Yes, actually, dregs of society. <laughs> Dregkin, dregkin. Uh, I don't know. Um, what is it like? Well, you have panhandlers. No, nope, that's that's a, not that's it. Definitely offensive. Bums. That's not definitely that's offensive. Not it. Hobos are offensive. Even uh, saying homeless hobos. is uh, offensive. Um, it's got to be some euphemistic thing like sanitary engineer. <laughs> You know, what? is for janitor. Engineer. Oh, I thought you were just saying that's what. <laughs> no, not for not for homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's that's that de- unsanitary engineer. If anything. <laughs> yeah, that's what. Um, oh. uh, it must be something like uh, societally challenged or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> societally challenged. <laughs> Why is that not it? What no. is it? Tell me. Transients. Oh, transients. Yeah, I've heard of that. Well, because they're, you know, transferring themselves from one bridge to the next yeah, or well, something, in, right? Yeah, tra- I mean, to be transitional or tr- to be transient, it's just funny because I used to say things like Arizona and Florida are just full of transients, uh, meaning the culture right. is strange because no one's there. from there. They just live here for a little while and they move on. And that seems like an appropriate use of the word transient. But now that that means homeless like it takes on a whole different meaning to say florida's full of transients or transient people is probably even better everyone likes you know keep it people um right. i've heard a lot recently about 
trans activists and trans rights and stuff. That's what this must be. Yeah, they're really pushing for the rights of homeless. So it's not. Oh, so I misspoke. It's not homophobic. It's transphobic. Yes, it's true. <laughs> if you if you if you don't like the homeless or if you don't donate to the homeless, you're transphobic. Exactly from from God, hob- that's what it is. From homophobic I to didn't, transphobic. <laughs> God, I just didn't understand when they were calling me. That. <laughs> Um, really uh, all right. Anyway, uh, back to uh, Myers Briggs. Yes. So, um, <laughs> introverts and extroverts. That's the introverts first and extroverts. So it's an E so or an what, I, right? What are you? I'm slightly E. Uh, when I take the test, like sixty forty. I mean, I could be considered. What, what is it called? An ambivert? When they're like, uh, in the I don't, I don't yeah, really like that term. I'm I don't s- either. Uh, people claim that. you've known me for a while. Know I think I'm an extrovert, but the thing is. Uh, as I'm getting older, man, I'm telling you, like I'm just more worn out by people, um, and and the, I, I I am discovering the joys of being alone, uh, and I'm more comfortable th- with that than ever, and so mm-hmm. I'm embracing my my inner introvert, my inner introvert, right? <laughs> so yeah, uh, but yeah, I'm slightly extroverted, and yeah. you would be. I'm definitely introverted. Uh, are you like on the I'm on the scale? Extra. Are you pretty far down there? Pretty far, or up yeah. There, I would say, or on the left or the right. Yeah, I would say eighty to ninety percent. I don't remember the last time I took a test. What the value? Do was, they do that out of a hundred? Because I want to say I was sixty forty. Yeah, does that sound like a thing? Sixty forty. I mean, yeah, possibly. It, you know, the tests vary whether you take a crappy online one. Or I've been told extrovert from every whatever. test I've taken, though. That if that tells you anything, yeah, I've, yeah. So, and I've been told introvert from every test I've taken, and it makes sense, and I'm sure it's right. Yeah. Just because if I go deal with people, then I come home and I'm like exhausted and like start to get a headache, and I'm like, oh. Even if it was a pleasant Whereas interaction. Can, um. Yes, uh, even if it was. Uh, whereas, you know, I can easily spend four or five days without leaving my apartment and just be like, doo, 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 just doing my stuff. See, even after and, one day, uh, I will get really antsy at home by myself. But so that suggests extrovert. Um, but I have come home yeah. just tired of with interactions that even were positive. Just like, oh, that was fun. But damn, I'm glad to be home by myself now. Well, yeah. Yeah, sure. And I, I'm sure everyone has that. And, you know, in the same way, like, Sometimes I'll feel like, oh, you know, it would be cool to say hi to my cashier today. And <laughs> when you're you know, feeling when real I go extroverted, the, <laughs> when, when I go through the Taco Bell drive-through and they they ask me how I am, you know, say, hey, I'm doing pretty good today. How about you? And you know, get my social interaction in. Oh yeah, because they care so much. That's why they ask. You know, they care about you. The Taco Bell drive-through people. <laughs> yeah. And they, I say, how are you doing today? Is everything right on the screen? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's all right. right. Pull forward. <laughs> um, uh, it was fun while uh, it lasted. Yeah, that was some good interaction. <laughs> and I'm so uh, tired so, now. <laughs> oh, whew, now I'm exhausted. I need to eat my burritos in peace. Um, so that's introvert, extrovert. I think that's probably the easiest of the four dichotomies to understand. Um. The the next one is probably the hardest to understand, and that's uh, between intuitive and sensing types. So and um, and those are indicated by so, two letters, right? S for sensing yeah, and in uh, for, intu- for in for intuitive. <laughs> gotcha. Because I is already used for introvert. I gotcha. Okay. So in um, and so these are they call them the the information gathering functions um so i guess as an example like sensing types uh they they like things to be uh, they like material presented to them in a detailed and like a sequential manner so they like everything to be detailed and laid out and and tangible and in front of them Mm -hmm. whereas intuitive types they're more into ideas and and theory and abstract uh, abstraction and stuff so sensing types want things they can deal with with their five senses and uh intuitive types they're more interested in like the underlying principles and and theories 
of things. So if you were to ask a sensing type, they, if you were to go to a cocktail party and ask the sensing type how was the party, would they be more likely to describe the decor and the room and maybe the intuitive would discuss the feel, like the vibe? Is that a way of yes. thinking about that? Yes, I, I think that's actually a pretty good a pretty good way to put that. Um, so sensings are collecting the data with the five senses in that sense. <laughs> And, yeah, intuitive right. got re- and the intuitive types metaphorically are reading taking the, the big the big picture right yeah uh, the big picture and they may miss the 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 little details um whereas the sensing types you know may may hyper focus on the details potentially so if, um, if- the, that one's a little kind of hard to understand anyway and that's the one that when I read it a long time ago I was just kind of like well, this is meaningless like nothing. But, but as I asked people what type they were, um, and observed them or thought about experiences I've had with them, I began to realize that I think maybe there's something something to it. Just because the way the way people communicate and take in information is super important, well, and especially but, conversationally, I was just thinking if you said sensing type if they're collecting data and then you were to ask how did that conversation go they would probably try to reflect on you know well what questions were asked and what what data points were there how did this what subjects were we talking about and which way did they go or is the intuitive would would say would 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 be more focused on like connectivity and flow and rhythm and smoothness and like I guess what you would call intuition, this sort meta of meta conversation, yeah, yeah, or like how, how you're building, you're collectively well, building together this idea, um, or sparring, or whatever, however the conversation is unfolding. But you'd be interested in that dance that is a conversation, you know, versus right. like that's the that's kind of how I see it too. Uh, I think that like if you were like when when you use the word meta anything, that's intuitive type stuff. If you say meta anything, then it's an intuitive type. So metacognition it, just confounds um, the sensing people. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't want to go that far, but yes. Um, <laughs> like, it was maybe spew my water. <laughs> I don't want to go that far, but yes, absolutely, hundred percent. Meta, meta, anything is the underlying idea or principle beneath whatever comes after the meta, and you know, it's it's abstracting out uh, an overarching idea from many of the whatever comes after meta. So if it's meta conversations, it's analyzing lots of different conversations for the underlying ideas behind them. Yeah. And that seems to be an intuitive thing to me. Now, I'm I'm biased because I'm I'm an intuitive type and I'm not, that's another strongly uh leaning one for me. What percentage so, of the population is is there a breakdown that way? Is it 50/50 introvert extrovert, do you know? Like is there a um, I actually I, I looked up some of this stuff uh, and um, I, I don't have the well. So for S types, uh, S types make up sixty six to seventy four percent of the population. Okay. So they're they're Most a majority. That's actually the yeah. That's actually the largest difference between the dichotomies. If you're an S type, um, actually for sorry, go ahead. I, for females, it's seventy to seventy five percent are S types. It. it, it stands to reason that S types are not going to have an amazing first date with someone because, uh, whereas intuitives could, I mean, I'm I'm being a little silly here, (laughs) but you get together and like sensing, explain that. Okay. So to sensing people or, or just a sensing person in general, um, you're collecting data and, and it's reasonable to say you can't, it takes a, there's a lot of data to be collected on a single human being. And if you're finding out if someone is date worthy, so you're, you know, what's your name? All those, he, let's exchange a lot of data. And then it could all, it could all be positive. Um, but like, that's still not enough or, you know, it's a very small picture to act upon. Whereas mm-hmm. intuitives can get together and you feel the connection and the vibe and the, the dance is going smoothly. And you just sense, well, I shouldn't use the word sense. It's probably the worst word I could use. You into it <laughs> that one another on the same page um and so mm, mm, i mean maybe uh, i i mean I, I agree with you in part but i think that you shouldn't maybe you shouldn't tie up sentimentality 
in with these two, you know, like the whole... Yeah, I think I am conflating. Well, because, you know, chemistry, There, you know, people use the word chemistry when they talk about meeting, and that could mean any number of things. Consensing uh, people I tend, <laughs> I tend to think that, and this is just my half-baked theory, but I tend to think that you have chemistry when you're matched either S-type to S-type or N-type to N-type. That's my half-baked theory. Uh, and and when you have a, a mismatch there, then maybe you can still have you can still have chemistry, but I think that it's a big barrier uh, to be overcome. Mm. Uh, as far as S types having good first dates, I think it would be pretty preposterous to suggest that S types can't have good yeah, first no, dates. Yeah, I was saying that it'd be uh-huh. provocative a little bit, but yeah. Um, but I think that well. Yeah, definitely the things that are going through their heads on a first date are are different. Um, they probably are analyzing data, as you put it, but I don't think it's as cold and, and disconnected as maybe that sounds. Um, like, I think they would probably pick up more on the, you know, the person's smile and the way their clothes are arranged and how nice their hair is, how well they present themselves, the t- the tone of their voice, um, things like that, and those things are can be important, yeah, right? Definitely. Uh, whereas um, an intuitive type might, you know, as you say, focus on the flow of conversation and the rhythm and whether uh, all you know both people have a relatively similar percentage of question questions asked and answered and things like that. Um, and, you know, so there are different aspects of what you pay attention to yeah. on a first date. But I think that, you know, for a sensing type, if all of the data that they're they're collecting fits what they want and they are having their conversational needs met as well, even though those needs may be different, I think they can still have a, a good first date. Yeah, that being said, I, I can never have a good first date with an S-type, so. Is it just readily apparent when you speak to an S-type <laughs> that you're speaking to an S-type? <laughs> No, 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 I'm just being <laughs> provocative too. Okay. But, I but thought you were is, serious. But, like, I could never have those freaking S-types. <laughs> I do have some slight amount of bias against S-types, um, but 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 not, not, Someone really. wants... not seriously. Uh, but yeah. I've, had, I've had a lot of conversations with, um, with, with people, uh, you know, especially particularly with dating, and I always try to bring up the... Uh, the Myers-Briggs test because I, I just find it an interesting subject and I think it's valuable to know how the other person works, how their personality works. Um, and I've like most of my anecdotal data for this N type S type stuff comes from those situations because I'll, I'll have a conversation with someone and if the conversation has a spark and is energetic and flows well, it, it tends to grow and build on itself mm-hmm. and Inevitably, with no exceptions, those conversations are with a, another N type. And then I've also had conversations that even though the word count can be pretty large and response times can be quick and we're writing long messages back and forth, there seems to just be like a, a strange disconnect in conversation. Like the things I'm saying have to be translated in some way and then interpreted, and then responded to. And then when I read the response, I'm like, oh, oh, wait a second. Where, that's not what I was talking about. And God, it's just really bizarre. The way I've characterized it is when an N-type and an S-type talk, it's like you're talking through some opaque wall. Your words have to kind of get squashed through this opaque wall, and when they come out the other side, they're a little bit mangled and different. A little muffled. Uh, yeah, yeah, muffled, and like you have to do some interpretation and stuff uh, that that just lessens the effectiveness of conversation. And I don't know how much of that is just circumstance or whether there's anything to that. I don't know. It's just my experience. So uh, maybe maybe other people have had a similar experience to that, I'd or maybe like to know the seventy four percent S types that are listening to this are gonna just be all pissed off. I don't know. <laughs> they just won't know what you're but, talking about. They'll just think you're weird and this is boring, right? I would like to know probably, that. Well, yeah. knowing that I'm intuitive and you're intuitive, I wonder if other intuitives will be more drawn to listening to this sort of conversation. And it would be a sensing the sensing type would just be like, ah. Oh. Um, I had a, a 
fellow teacher once told me that um, upwards of 85% of uh, um, English teachers specifically are intuitive. Uh, and then it goes along with just enjoying literature connecting with it in a way and i don't know yeah. why exactly uh, i can theorize that wouldn't but... surprise me at all well i mean because uh literature is not a it, it's not a discipline of data right, right. i mean it's not why we the read whole novels point, yeah the, yeah the whole point of a novel is to convey underlying themes and messages and ideas and all of it's so, meta I mean, yeah all metaphorical right meta i wonder <laughs> Ah, ah, there you go. All those fours All those in four. there. <laughs> that metaphor. Um, um, I wonder, I would be interested to see, I, I, I don't know if this data exists, but I would be interested to see um, the preferences for fiction and nonfiction between intuitive and sensing types because I would suspect that sensing types would prefer nonfiction. I would think so too, yeah. Intuitive Based types on would our understanding, fiction. how... Uh, how confident yeah. are you in all that we're saying about sensing and intuitive and our understanding of that or your understanding? Um, well, somewhat confident. I mean, like, you know, the the facts, you know, the descriptions of the terms I took from, uh, you know, from literature on the Myers-Briggs. Yeah. Now, all of my opinions and stuff that's just from my experience and you qualified so. that too so yeah so we've done the e um, the e or i introvert extrovert right. intuitive sensing what's next right um next is thinking and feeling um so these are the decision making functions is what they're called so they're pretty intuitive um <laughs> like they make sense based on the words uh so but i thinking think types, and i feel why am i not both well because you don't it depends on how you make your decisions. What 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 motivates you primarily in your decision making? So a, a thinking type would make decisions in a more detached and logical fashion. They value consistency and reason and fitting a set of rules. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, feeling types, they decide more based on empathy, uh, association with people, and consensus. Yes, yeah. A pretty clear distinction between between us. Um, although I will say that uh, I'm not as strongly thinking as I am intuitive or introverted, so I'm a little closer to the middle there. Um, right. Well, it doesn't mean. Uh, an important thing to, well, sure. A important thing to note too is it doesn't mean that thinking types can't feel or feeling types can't think. It's just that's your primary, that's your go-to for when you have to make a decision. That's what you, that's your knee-jerk thing that you that you start with first. Um, so you know, right. Um, so that's that distinction. Pretty pretty straightforward, I think. Um, uh, and then the fourth dichotomy is, um, between judging and perceiving another kind of confusing one. So the way, the way these are described are lifestyle preference. Um, and so the, the description for these was a, a little confusing to me, so I'll, I'll just say it. Um, so judging types, the J types, they show the world their preferred judging function. So that's thinking or feeling. So... For example, if you're a if you're a TJ, a thinking judging type, then you would appear to the world as rational. You're showing the world the T part of yourself. Whereas an FJ, the feeling type, would appear as empathetic. And by contrast, if you're not a judging type, then you show the world your perceiving function. So that's your intuitive or sensing type. So an NP would appear abstract to the world and an SP would appear concrete. So it kind of, uh, whether you're J or P tells you which of these other two categories you show to the world. That's the description that, that's how they're defined. Yeah, that's how, that's kind of how they're, they're defined. Yes. Yes. So, 
So if you're a J, if you're a, if you're a, yeah, if you're a J type, then you're showing to the world your judging function. So that's the T or F. Um, and because you're an FJ, that means that you appear to the world or you show the world that you are empathetic. Uh, y- well, yes. I mean, because you're an F type, then you're more empathetic. But because you're a J, you show the world. If you were an FP uh, instead, then you wouldn't show the F. You would show whichever between N and S you are. So that's the way it's defined. That's that's the way it's defined. I find that a little bit confusing. And so, and not that useful. But here's, well, sure. But here's here's what at least I have tended to notice um uh between j and and p types that's a, a little bit more uh a little bit more concrete anyway j types uh are organized and on time and p types are disorganized and late all the time <laughs> yes it is about organization and that Uh, I'm not. I'm not trying to match the definitions. I'm just st- stating my observations. And well, I mean, that is. It's not just. It's not just my observation. Like if you if you read about J and P types, it says that uh, P types are are more disorganized and and more prone to being late, whereas J types are more punctual. Now, why that's the case, you know, I don't know. Like, it's built into the category, I suppose. I don't know, but then... But then maybe I mean, you can imagine the mad scientist type with file folders overflowing with paper data, and they have experiments going all the time, and some beakers with goop in them, and they have all of this tons of data, and it's just everywhere disorganized. Right. I mean, that's almost a, a stereotype, right? Uh, the scientist, the eccentric scientist, like running into the door fifteen minutes late with papers, you know, strewn out behind him. And his hair hair all askew, and you know his tie is crooked and everything. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm late, class. Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that's your uh that's your F type coming in there. Well, well, I mean, I agree, but not everyone thinks about it. Well, I mean, Because it's just 15 minutes. I mean, it's just 15 minutes off. Like, that's not going to kill you if you're 15 minutes late to something. Like, so what? That's, I mean, I think that is the the reason, you know. It's like, oh, so what? You know, they just, they were doing something else and, you know, lost track of time. I don't know. Don't ask me. Ask ask these stupid P types that are out there like with their crumbs in their car and you know, they lose everything and
What are you doing? Are you not staying in the kitchen like you're supposed to? Where have you been? Why are these dishes here? <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> you don't know her her personality type. Wow. Yeah, you should definitely get her to uh to take a test and figure out. Uh, but you could probably you I mean you probably could could do it. If I had to I I've, I've only met her I've met her one time. Uh if I had to categorize her, I would categorize her as INFP. Not ENFP, sorry. ENFP. Yeah, she's definitely extroverted. That, I mean that may that may be the case but but you don't you don't have a career in theater and be an introvert like that's just pretty yeah Yeah, well, you're yeah, you're pretty uptight when it comes to cleanliness. I w you're probably super strongly J type, I would say. Oh well, I will I will tell you this. This is an interesting fact that I didn't know before I uh, I researched this uh, a little bit. Um, so there are two personality disorders that correlate strongly to particular types. So INTP is strongly correlated with uh, schizotypal behavior, so schizophrenia. And then ISTJ is strongly correlated with obsessive compulsive disorder. So there, there's your potentially uptight, you know, in the extreme person uh, who is an ISTJ uh, and potentially OCD as well. Yeah. So I actually I had a coworker one time who was uh very clearly ISTJ and I had the misfortune of playing board games with him um a lot and oh man what a nightmare what an absolute nightmare Yeah yeah we just fell into that situation we were walking down the hall and I you know was carrying a board game and we ran into each other around the corner and I dropped the board game on the ground and it then we just started playing it. But no, it was a group of coworkers. We were all we all got together, and he happened to be there. But like he was super like rule oriented and detail oriented, and wanted to like work out every move carefully. And whenever anything would be even remotely questionable, he would dig into the rule book and. <laughs> flipping through the pages and like ugh god and he would argue about stuff god he was just the worst ugh but if the it, well, there you go. If the goal of the game, yeah, if the goal of the game is to have fun, is the goal of the game to have fun, or is the goal of the game to play by every rule? I mean, there are, you know, this is why this is why house rules come into play because you know certain house rules are tailored to certain houses and certain groups of people and players, and so the rules should benefit the game, and so that everyone, if it's not some cutthroat competitive game you know, and it's just a game everyone's playing for fun, then the rules should facilitate that. You have to have some rules, otherwise the game is just chaos. But 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 being super nitpicky about things 
to the point of undoing multiple plays because one thing was wrong. Like, that's just too much. Yeah, sure, there can be extenuating circumstances. Yeah, extenuating circumstances that make that sort of hyper-focus <clears throat> important. And, like, I would say, too, like, professional sports or something, you know, these are professionals, and they are paid to know the rules and abide by them. So, yeah, you pay attention to the rules, and if the rules are broken, then there should be a penalty. But, <clears throat> yeah. But if this is like, you know, a pickup game of a uh, of frisbee, you know, and someone like goes out of bounds just before a touchdown, then uh or or you know, they're on the line or whatever. They score a touchdown, a field goal, a touchback. Touchback. Well, just tossing the old pig skin around. Um, so yeah, that's. Um, I, I have some questions that, you know, I was kind of thinking about. We already hit a lot of those, actually, um, particularly the uh, communication between N and S types. I think if I had to pick out the most interesting thing from all of Myers-Briggs, it would be N type, S type, at least for me, because I find it the most mysterious and yet the most important. Like, I think that introverts and extroverts can get along fantastically. I mean, maybe not for const not constantly, you know, over a period of a week, if an introvert and extrovert had to be like connected, uh, you know, by handcuffs, they would probably drive each other insane. But, um, but, uh, generally they can get along fine. Now you and I get along. Okay. Anyway. And I, I think that thinking and feeling types, uh, despite what you may think actually can get along well and complement each other pretty well because they actually make each other consider uh, complementary sides of the coin. When faced with a decision, then those two people can have a dialogue and discuss every aspect of an issue rather than just thinking about the cold hard facts or just being swayed by uh, empathy. So I actually think Right. Yeah, I, I think that one is fine. And then the JMP type um, is a little more contentious, but like I, I think that it's e relatively easy to overlook uh, disorganization or impunctuality. Um, like uh, that can cause some friction for sure, but I just don't think the trait's magnitude is all, all that great. Now, with N type and S type, I think the, converse, the potential for conversational disconnect is considering that communication is one of the most important things that human beings can do, arguably the most important thing that human beings can do, and the fact that N types and S types have this barrier, this strange opaque wall between them, like I, I think that's a huge deal. Um, and so that's the that's the part that interests me the most. Right. Sure, yeah. The point, the meaning of the conversation, like, 
why have this conversation? Where did it come from and where is it going? And how does it fit into our overall relationship? Those questions remain unanswered in a conversation between an N-type and an S-type, at least from the N-type perspective. Well, yeah. Well, so often humor is an abstraction, right? So humor will link two disparate ideas with one abstract concept that are that that barely ties the two together, and it's up to the person who receives the joke to understand that connection and and see the humor in these two different ideas. And so like there's a huge component of abstraction to humor, and since you know, abstraction is the intuitives. Uh, they love abstraction, and sensing type people aren't so fond of it. Then that's not to say that sensing types don't have a sense of humor, but no, I I, I can't. No, uh, well, I'm not sure. Um, I I wouldn't say so. I think it's just a different, yeah, a different brand of humor, maybe. Um, well, and also, also keep in mind too, that, that it's not like sensing and intuitive isn't, isn't binary. You're not 100% sensing or 100% intuitive. You're some blend of the two. So that's, so a person who is, you know, 65% on the sensing type end might still be able to connect abstract jokes, just not my jokes. Um, because my jokes are so much more abstract and, and better, uh, yeah, that's right. Meta, meta jokes. They're not even funny, really, until like 10 jokes in, and then they get funny. Yeah, right. And then I like get naked and run into a wall. <laughs> and that's funny because it's concrete and you can sense it with your senses. That's the kind of humor that S types find funny is slapstick. No, uh, that's uh, you know, that's a um, you know, that's a that is an interesting theory. Maybe, maybe I I I would be willing to to uh examine that yeah to test that yeah that's interesting hmm. um anyway like in terms of uh talking points regarding this like that that was one of the main ones that i wanted to talk about and we we hit that pretty hard and it was enjoyable um another thing that you that um you touched on briefly is uh how how you feel your type change over time so i was going to ask like if you've ever felt your type change or broaden or whatever, just over the course of your life, as long as you've, like, whether whether it's known about the uh, Myers Briggs personality test or just thinking back and reflecting on the the traits that you now know are part of this test, like you you mentioned that you felt yourself uh, kind of become more uh, comfortable being alone. Okay.
Mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense um uh according to stuff um people 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 tend to broaden their traits as they get older particularly in their late 20s and onward they tend to become more moderate in all of the uh all four of the dichotomies Well, that suggests that that suggests that the traits are environmentally imposed. That you know you develop the traits because you look at other people and and admire certain traits, and therefore you develop the traits. Do you, do you think that's the case? <laughs> wow, he was so mature. Well, <laughs> well, I think that, well, I, I mean, I think you're on to something, but I think that probably, uh, if I had to guess, he probably has certain personality traits that, uh, that, that make his area of comfort, um, sort of going back home and sipping on a cold Coors, you know, the taste of the Rockies. Yeah, an old brewski. Um, uh, so, you know, maybe a little bit more introverted or, um, or or maybe even sensing type. I don't know. Like whatever traits might, might uh, where, where that situation would fit right in. And so if that is his value or else that's where he feels most comfortable, then that encourages him to portray a persona in which that environment is socially acceptable. So... You play up that persona, and then people are more likely to accept you doing that particular circumstance where you're more, most comfortable. Does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. 
dip and dip, dip and dip, just dipping my dip, dipping dots, just doing my dipping dots. Well, camouflage jackets, right? But but th- this this Papa character, if he grew up on an island, then he might develop n- naturally a predilection to you know go sit in his serene spot overlooking the ocean and enjoy a nice coconut. Well, I was thinking about this. Uh, I recently went went home. Um, uh, to my parents' house for Thanksgiving, and uh, they had redone the carpet, and so they had to clean out my old closet where I had all my toys and everything from my childhood. And uh, so I had to go through all of my childhood toys, and, and my dad wanted to get rid of a lot of stuff, uh, so I had to go throw away a bunch of old childhood toys and everything. Um, I'm not really that sentimental when it comes to, to items, so I wasn't that resistant. Now, there are a few things that... I uh, that well, I'm I'm pretty pragmatic, so there were some things that I thought oh, this might actually be useful sometime, like my Pokemon cards, uh, which I looked up, and I could sell. Yeah, I could sell those things. Um, I, I probably have I probably have five hundred dollars worth of Pokemon cards based on the prices I looked up. Um, it would be a pain. God no, absolutely not. I mean, I was a kid, so I didn't spend anything on them. Um, but like, you know, like a pack of cards was—I don't know how much were they, like two bucks or something. Yeah, I mean, oh yeah, my yeah right. My collection was probably I probably have two hundred cards. Um, like the average value of a card now is you know, over a dollar. Um, per card, and some cards, if they're in like mint condition and crap, then they sell for hundreds of dollars. Um, my most value, yeah, I looked up my most my most valuable card when I was at home, uh, and it's not in great condition, so it it's worth like twenty seven dollars. That's not bad though. It. It wasn't. It wasn't enough for me. It wasn't enough for me to like bring it back and like, you know, package them up and try to sell. I was just like, eh, I'll just leave them in my closet for another ten years, and you know, we'll see where they are later if Pokemon are still around. Um, but yeah, like Pokemon cards and a bunch of old gaming stuff that you know I might want to get out the Super Nintendo and play some NBA Jam uh, or something since I'm a big basketball fan now. Um, but anyway, uh, the, the reason I bring this up is because, um, I actually used to collect Hot Wheels, the Hot Wheels cars, and, um, as a, and I pulled out my case with all of my Hot Wheels and opened it to find, I'd forgotten about this, that every little slot in the case, I had named the car and written on the bottom of the car, oftentimes it'll say the model and the year, so I had named the car and written a model and a year for every car in the case, and I had them all in their own little slot and organized by type of car. I really liked Corvettes as a kid, so I had like a whole row for Corvettes, and I was just an organized freaking kid. I had everything like labeled and in a case and organized, and like I collected Hot Wheels when I was like, I mean, I was like seven years old or something, and like that kind of tendency. Well, that that's what I was wondering. Like, when does this stuff appear? I'm sure there have been studies done on infants and toddlers to, you know, try to assess their personality that that early. And I bet I bet there's something to say for that.
Yeah, I did. My I had stuff. I had stuff all over the floor and everything. I mean, I grew up in the ghetto, um, and so you know our house. I'm telling the truth. I grew up in the ghetto. Our house wasn't that nice or or anything, and my room wasn't that big. Uh, but I had a lot of junk. I mean, I had a lot of toys. I collected all kinds of nonsense as a kid. I collected rock. I had these. I still had these collections in my closet when I went home. I had bottle caps, rocks, seashells, bouncy balls. Um, I had like little little toy lizards. You char- you characterize me as very possessive. I I don't know about that. I mean, I was somewhat possessive. Yeah, but 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 also, all right. Here here's my explanation. So the the video you're referring to is I was very possessive of my sleeping bag and pillow at a sleepover when we were kids, and that is the case. But also consider that that J types uh, are organized and 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 tend to prioritize cleanliness. And my pillow and my sleeping bag, I don't want other people putting their grubby hands on it or using it and slobbering on my pillow or putting their pillow in between their legs or putting it on the floor where the dog walks and everything. I don't want people messing with my pillow. There's a cleanliness aspect to that. Well, yeah, I mean, I I don't dispute that. I mean, well, just because, I mean, I'm the kind of person who thinks that uh, people's things are their responsibility. And so, you know, if you need a dollar, then, well, you should have had a dollar instead of asking me for one. Um, or, but... Yeah, not me. I would just save the gummy bears for later and then eat my gummy bears when I wanted gummy bears later. I don't know, that's just the way it was for me. I didn't I didn't but but I would um well, I was also a weird kid cuz I brought my lunch every day. Um every day with only slight exception from kindergarten all the way through my senior year of high school, I brought my lunch to school and I would eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every one of those days. Um, that I brought my lunch, it was always peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and some potato chips and a juice box or soda. Yeah, the potato chips, yeah, I I went through phases on the chips. It was Pringles mostly when I was in elementary school. I loved sour cream and onion Pringles. I would lick the sour cream and onion powder off of all the Pringles and then stack them up and then eat the chips last. It was pretty disgusting. Yeah, pretty disgusting. But man, that powder, for whatever reason as a kid, I freaking love that sour cream and onion powder. I would just lick it all off. If I was getting kind of full, I, would, I wouldn't eat the chips. I would just lick the powder off of them and then throw the chips away. <laughs> they weren't that soggy. They weren't soggy. I didn't slobber on them. It was pretty gross, though. Um, ugh. Whew. Yeah, I don't I don't eat sour cream and onion chips anymore. I, I'm not a big fan. But I went through phases. Yeah, they're I mean, they're all right, but um I think even though I haven't eaten many PB and J's in recent years, I don't like I think it'll be years before I can overcome that. I, I did a calculation one time and I estimated how many peanut butter and jelly sandwiches I've eaten in my life. Um and I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but this was like, this was mid college when I did the calculation, and it was in over three thousand peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I mean, I ate I ate one peanut butter and, sa- and jelly sandwich every school day from kindergarten until tenth grade. In tenth grade, I started eating two peanut butter and jelly sandwiches a day. I was a growing boy, 
and and I did that through the rest of high school. And then in college, I frequently ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, though not every day. And then even after college, I would make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, you know, on a weekly basis. Um, yeah, it's very little flavor fatigue, and I don't love them. Um, just no flavor fatigue, and they're easy and cheap. Now... I, I don't eat much. I, I've actually been very PB and J less for the last, I would say, probably four years. Um, I don't eat that many of them. In fact, the last two years, I don't. I haven't even really bought bread very much. I'm just. I don't make my own sandwiches and and eat them. Uh, yeah. So uh, I don't know. I just. I wouldn't have a taste for sandwiches enough that I would go through a whole loaf of bread by myself. So that's why I haven't really done it. Yeah, you can freeze bread, and I I have done that before, but you know, uh, nah, I just I haven't been doing that. Yeah, it's yeah, harder to chew. Frozen bread, ugh. Yeah. So yeah, PB and J. Nah. What? How do we? How do we get on? How do we get onto that? PB. Uh, I guess it was because talking about as a kid, I was a just a weird kid. That's yeah, because I labeled everything, and so I was saying that as a kid, I was even as a kid, I was a j- organized J type. Yeah. Hmm. Right. We need to try to get David on the podcast sometime. Oh yeah, I could ask him about football. God, he would get everything. He could he should ask me about football. That would actually be funny. Minnesota Vikings. San Francisco 49ers. Oh, wow. Good job, man. <laughs> Deflate gate. Deflate gate. I know it. Tim T-Bone. Oh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's got a lot of sexual harassment claims against him recently. Yeah, sucks for him. <laughs> um, uh, what was that? I understand. You want to end the podcast. That's pretty good. All right. Why don't we uh we can do that or why don't you just make a jingle at the end every time? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know about that, but yeah, that'll be captured really well. <laughs> All right, well, and, until next time, 